Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Ryan Davis, and I'm a junior at the college, and I'm the chair of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag Transatlantic Forum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Ambassador Pedro Morines, Ambassador David O'Sullivan, Julie Smith, Ambassador Peter Wittig, our moderator, Professor Nick Burns, and Dean of the T Kennedy School, Doug Elmendorf. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, it is my uh, honor and privilege to thank you to begin uh, tonight's forum discussion. Today, Harvard Kennedy School is launching its new project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship. The transatlantic relationship has been a cornerstone of the post-World War II order, helping to bring peace and prosperity in Europe, uh, North America, and around the world for many years now. Our goal in this project is to understand better and to deepen this relationship for the 21st century. The new project uh, will be housed in our Belfer Center of Science and International Affairs, uh, led by uh, faculty chair uh, Nick Burns uh, and executive director Catherine Kluver Ashbrook. Uh, the project uh, will uh, encompass security policy, diplomacy, economics, and trade and strengthening of Western democracies. Nick and Catherine, their colleagues, uh, will help to train the next generation of uh, leaders and experts uh, on relations between uh, Europe and North America. They will use the convening power of the Kennedy School to bring together, as they have this evening, uh, distinguished people uh, from both sides of the Atlantic to help us understand uh, and to help us help them advance the transatlantic relationship. I am so enthusiastic about what this new project uh, will do uh, for the school and uh, for the world. So this is a very special evening for us. It is also a special evening because of a tremendous collection uh, of distinguished guests. Um, I am not going to introduce all of them. I will leave that uh, to Nick Burns. I will just um, say a few words about Nick and then I'll get out of the way. Nick doesn't need much introduction uh, in this audience or in many places around the world. But for those who do not know, uh, Nick Burns is the Roy and uh, Barbara Goodman family professor of the practice of diplomacy and international relations. He is the faculty chair of the Future of Diplomacy project and of course of this new project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship. Uh, before coming to the Kennedy School, Nick served uh, for 27 years in the US Foreign Service including a State Department spokesman, U.S. Ambassador to NATO, U.S. Ambassador to Greece, and uh, the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. We are very lucky to have Nick at the Kennedy School all the time, and these guests are with us tonight, so please join me in giving them a warm welcome. <laughs> Doug, uh, Dean Elmendora, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to see everyone here. I'm going to introduce this panel, but I have to say um, I'm so pleased that Ambassador David Thorne is here in the second row. David was uh, President Obama's ambassador in Italy. Uh, Ash Carter is going to be joining us tonight and giving a speech to us uh, at dinner tonight. And Ash and I go way back, and he's a big part of this transatlantic relationship when he was Secretary of Defense after the invasion of Crimea. Ash led the way to reinforce uh, the NATO battalions, brigades, excuse me, and uh, U.S. brigades in Germany, in Europe, to make containment work. So welcome to Ash. Manuel Moniz, who's a dean at the IE School in Madrid in Spain, is our 
partner in this effort. He's one of the four people, along with Catherine and I, who have built this. Carl Kaiser, of course, who is a living, a living embodiment of the European bridge. German, worked for both Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, president of the German Council on Foreign Relations, professor emeritus. So the four of us have tried to envisage this program to deepen Harvard's involvement in Europe. We want to um, raise money, raise funds for a professorship, along with the help of our dean. We're going to do that, create a professorship in European studies. We want to expand research here. We want to bring more European students here through fellowships. We certainly want to bring more public officials uh, from Europe, from, our em from their embassies in Washington, but also across the pond here because we're facing a multiplicity of challenges. We're facing the Putin challenge in Eastern Europe, preying upon the smaller countries to his south and west. We're facing a populist challenge in the German elections in 2017, the Dutch elections, the French elections. I can say this, the current diplomats cannot in the current governments of Hungary and Poland, a populist challenge, anti-democratic. And I will also say we're facing the Trump challenge. My personal view is that we've never had a president since Harry Truman was so weak in attachment to NATO, he's highly ambivalent about it, and who treats the European Union like a competitor, not a strategic partner of the United States. That's quite a series of challenges. So we want to make this program um, deep here. We want to make it meaningful for the transatlantic relationship, and that's the those are the issues we'll talk about tonight. To my left is Ambassador Peter Wittig, who is the ambassador of Germany to the United States. Uh, he's busy this week because Chancellor Merkel arrives Thursday for a meeting with President uh, Trump on Friday. Uh, and Peter was ambassador to the United Nations before he moved from New York to Washington. To his left is Julianne Smith. Julie has become one of the biggest most important voices in Washington and, and across the country promoting the transatlantic bridge. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. She has a great daily offering called The Dish, which is all the news you want to know about Europe and the United States. She's pioneered a program to bring Americans outside of the East Coast to um, the Midwest and to the far west and the south to talk about transatlantic relations which is very important. And to her left is Ambassador Pedro Morenas, who is the ambassador of Spain uh, to the United States and has been since 2017. He was a colleague of Ashes because Ambassador Morenas was for six years the defense minister of Spain, long career in the Spanish government, long career in Spanish business. Ambassador, you're welcome. And last but not least, Ambassador David O'Sullivan, who really doesn't need an introduction because he comes to Harvard every year faithfully for our European conference. But David is the ambassador of the European Union to the United States, longtime official, ran the European Union Act, uh, External Action Service for many years, longtime official of the EU, but he's also an Irish diplomat. And that automatically means He's the most popular person in this room because he's in Massachusetts, the capital of Irish America. So welcome to the panel. Um, we're going to talk about three big issues here. Um, we're going to first talk about the divisions between the United States and Europe, some of the disagreements. Second, about the Putin challenge in all of its dimensions. And third, about the challenge to democracy. After we have that discussion, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. And Peter, why don't we just go right down the row here in order. This first question is, Emmanuel Macron is here. First state visit of the Trump administration is for the president of France, which is, I think, a good reflection of the administration's interests in Europe. Um, and, and then f quickly followed by Chancellor Merkel, your chancellor on Friday. Um, we are facing between the Europeans and the Americans a trade war right now a big disagreement on climate change because the United States has left the Paris Agreement. Um, perhaps a disagreement, perhaps a resolution of how we feel about the Iran nuclear deal. And your government's been very involved in that. So are you worried about this collection of troubles across the Atlantic or do you think they can be managed by diplomats like you? 
Well, thank you, Nick, for including me in this distinguished panel. Uh, the transatlantic relations uh, for us are vital, the relationship between Germany and, and the U.S. Uh, the role of uh, the U.S. in our post-war development uh, and uh, evolution is, was just crucial. Uh, it was the U.S. who turned us into a thriving democracy, embedded us in NATO, and helped us with unification uh, like no other country. So. For us, this relationship is really key and vital. We come from a strong base. We do have some disagreements right now, and you named uh, a couple of them, uh, trade, uh, the, the Iran issue, uh, climate change. Um, but uh, our approach is not turn away from uh, the United States, uh, but keep engaging more. Uh, we should uh, talk more and uh, on issues and not uh, talk about ourselves or the other partner. Uh, so we are um, ready to engage with this president, with this administration on those disagreements. And you named a couple of them. One important one is Iran, uh, the Iran deal. Uh, we believe uh, it's a uh, deal that serves the purpose, a very narrow purpose. Um, to block uh, Iran's pathway to a nuclear bomb. Uh, it's, uh, for us, enhances the national security, enhances the regional uh, security. This is the opinion not only of Germany and the E3, but of the whole of Europe. We are behind this deal. Now, we notice that um, this deal has been uh, criticized by the president, and he has uh, said this loudly and clearly. Um, and he has given us some homework, the three Europeans, uh, in his statement on the 12th of uh, January. And we have been uh, discussing uh, with um, the American delegation on a way forward to salvage this deal. We have had productive uh, discussions, uh, and we believe we address the concerns of the president on the so-called so sunset clause, on the access of the International Atomic Energy, uh, agency and on the missile issues. Um, so uh, I think we have something to show uh, after those uh, months of uh, talks. In the end, it's up to the president to decide, and we don't know how he will decide. Uh, we believe um, uh, it's worthwhile keeping this deal, otherwise we'll have a serious uh, rift in the transatlantic uh, relations uh, that would uh, be uh, something we want to avoid. Yeah, the clock is ticking because the president has to certify in our system by May 12th right. whether or not he continues to waive the sanctions or reimpose sanctions. If he reimposes sanctions, the U.S. is in violation of the deal. There was a remarkably detailed article in the New York Times, I don't know how this happens this morning, by Peter Baker, front page, about this agreement. And just so we can all understand it, Germany, France, and Britain have been negotiating with the State Department on a document that would reassure President Trump of the solidity of this deal, but Russia, China, and of course Iran are not party to it. So these would be conditions that the four countries, the three Europeans and the United States, would exercise. Is that one way that, to understand that, it? That's correct, and that corresponds to what the President said on uh, in January 12th. He basically addressed uh, the issues that irked him to us, not to uh, China and Russia and Iran, but he addressed them to the European uh, countries, which was surprising to us because uh, we thought if we want to renegotiate, uh, then of course we have to re renegotiate with all the partners of that agreement. Uh, but uh, we worked on a, a common document, as you, as you said, it's not yet finalized, we are on a good path, and we think in that document we show a pathway how we can address the concerns of the President without rewriting the JCPOA, right. the Iran deal. This is something we will not and cannot do. We will not unilaterally rewrite that deal. But we can give assurances, for instance, that we will never allow Iran to possess the nuclear bomb under no circumstances. 
and we have detailed that in that document. And we think it, it should reassure those many skeptics uh, in the US, and I understand that this is a very contested issue in the United States. It's not contested at all in Europe, so we are coming from very different platforms, but it should reassure the skeptical audience in the United States that we do mean business in uh, blocking Iran's pathway to a nuclear bomb for good. So just one more quick follow-up, because this is the central issue this week that your chancellor and President Macron and President Trump are working on. Javed Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, made the tours of our Sunday talk shows, mm -hmm. held meetings with lots of Americans this weekend. He railed against the Trump administration leaving the Iran deal, but he didn't speak out against this possibility. So if you were to agree to this, Iran would just have to accept it, I guess. They wouldn't like it but we would have a unity among the four countries about strengthening ballistic missiles and sanctions. Well, as I said, this would Threat not, of sanctions. This was not, would not rewrite the deal, but it addresses certain issues that are on the, on the mind of the president, and frankly, on our mind. One is um, the missile issue. I think that is really a serious issue. We will and should not allow Iran to develop intercontinental ballistic missiles. And this is where we are standing with this uh, administration. We are also standing with this administration on a lot of the regional issues. We know that uh, Iran has, has been uh, playing a very problematic role in the region, from Yemen to Syria. We want to address that. And we want to address that with the United States in the framework of a coherent as much as you can have one, a coherent strategy. This is what we want to work uh, uh, with the United States uh, about. Thank you, and thank you for asking, answering all these questions. Mm -hmm. Julie, this big question of the health of the relationship, you've lived through it, and it was interesting. We had a student debate today as part of the launch of this program, and I thought that, that Catherine uh, engineered so well, and I thought it was interesting. One of the students said, what's the big deal? We've always had disagreements across the Atlantic, and he named them from the 40s, 50s, 60s onward. It was a very good point. Are we exaggerating this, or do you really sense, I mean, you, you were Joe Biden's deputy national security advisor, so you lived it. Do we have a fundamental problem here across the Atlantic? <laughs> well, first, uh, let me congratulate you, Nick, personally, on the launch of this new project, and, and of course, Harvard, and Catherine, and the whole team. <laughs> uh, it's needed uh, in today's environment, and I look forward to seeing how the project unfolds and uh, hope we can stay connected. Um, on the state of the relationship, I mean, folks are right to point out that we've had a number of uh, peaks and valleys over many, many years. Uh, certainly during the Iraq War in the early 2000s, that was a very dark period in the transatlantic relationship where we disagreed deeply about how to address counterterrorism challenges in places like Iraq and uh, had debates over counterterrorism practices, things like uh, waterboarding and all the rest. But I do think that this period is a little bit unique. On the one hand, transatlantic policies are moving forward, even with this administration. This administration is supporting things like the European Deterrence Initiative, supporting resources being poured into particularly Central and Eastern Europe, something that Ash Carter spent a great deal of time on that's been continued, and we've all been relieved to see something like that continue. We'll have a NATO summit this summer yeah. uh, where all of the heads of state uh, will gather with Donald Trump uh, and put forward some important initiatives on readiness, on mobility, and continuing to focus on NATO's uh, toolkit. And the list goes on. But what I think is missing from the transatlantic relationship right now, and particularly on our side of the Atlantic, is an emphasis on, one, the values piece, 
when Rex Tillerson, as Secretary of State, gave his first speech at the Woodrow Wilson Center last fall, it was a great speech, except it was missing the values piece. This administration is definitely looking at the relationship in a different light, very much in transactional terms. And you heard that today. There was a short press avail before the formal press conference with Macron today. And President Trump. Where, yeah. Yes, where President Trump and Macron were just casually making a few uh, statements. And Trump, uh, what he had to say was, this is what we're doing on trade. I'm happy with France. I'm unhappy with the EU. Definitely ticking down a list. For Trump, it's how are you doing on defense spending? What does our trade relationship look like? Period. Not as much about the value of the relationship, what we stand for, how we're going to counter Russia's attempts to divide us, to undermine our democracies. So yes, while the folks working inside the administration right now are moving policy forward, quite remarkably so, what we're not seeing is America and the United States now, I mean, America and Europe working together on looking at the post-manufacturing economy. How are we gonna tackle that together? What is our broader Russia strategy? How are we gonna work together on questions of Russian disinformation campaigns? How are we gonna cope with AI and robotics and what that's going to do to us across multiple fronts? So I don't see this forward-leaning vision being presented by Donald Trump, by his cabinet members. What I see is a little bit of maintenance, and we all just sigh relief when Trump shows up at the NATO summit. That's enough. Um, but I don't, I don't see him leaning into those types of forums and those summits where America is often presenting the big ideas. And so I do, I do feel that this is different. Yes, we've had loads of disagreements over decades, particularly on defense spending. That's an issue countless administrations have tried to tackle. But what's happening inside the West writ large and our inability as partners to cope with it, I think that feels different to me than it has in years past. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? Um, Ambassador Doug Lute is here, and Doug is uh, one of our senior fellows at the Belfer Center. We're very proud to have Doug here. Doug's going to be leading a project to think about the future of NATO as part of this new Europe program. Um, do we need, in, the, in this administration, do we need to be thinking in much bigger terms because NATO's in its 17th year in Afghanistan, training mission in Iraq. We now have to effectively contain Putin in Eastern Europe. And Trump's done a good job of putting the spending issue on the table. You have to give credit to President Trump for that. Do you think this is time for a big leap forward in where NATO needs to go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you should seize on these opportunities when summits appear. They're wonderful opportunities to put forward big, bold, new ideas. And again, there will be some new initiatives launched at the, at the summit, important ones to ensure that we could move forces across the European continent with efficiency and with great speed. NATO will also be announcing um, that it's moving from seven commands to nine. It's going to have a new command for the Atlantic, which is very important, and one for logistics, uh, which will be housed actually in Germany. Um, those are important tactical decisions that NATO needs to be taking. But NATO as an institution also needs to be thinking about collectively what is the broader strategy towards Russia. We're having a hard time even having that conversation because we have a president that frankly doesn't really want to talk about Russia in that light and views any conversation about Russia as some sort of um, uh, statement about his election and we get back to Russian interference and I mean NATO shouldn't be talking about any of that but it's hard for Trump to be part of a conversation on Russia and that's what we should be focused on. We should also be looking at the Balkans which they're not in the news but they they could be soon. Uh, a lot of instability across that region. The Black Sea, we have not spent enough uh, time focused on that. Uh, there's a whole host of issues that really need some love and affection right now. And I fear that with Donald Trump sitting at the chair at the summit, we're not going to get the momentum that we need. Thank you very much. 
Ambassador, you have, you've had a unique perspective because you've been a business leader, you've been a political leader observing the transatlantic relationship, but you've also been defense minister and now ambassador in Washington. Um, do you agree with a student today that we shouldn't make too much of the transatlantic troubles? Or as Julie says, is there a deeper conflict underway here or a deeper separation of the two sides of the Atlantic? Well, if I take into consideration the last uh, six years I spent as Minister of Defense and being part of uh, the government in, in Spain and listening to my colleagues there, I strongly believe that uh, I strongly believe that uh, mm, the, the the idea in 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 NATO meetings were always based on credibility uh, towards the threats that we had in front of us, and for me the the, the basics of credibility is unity. The, the 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 strongest message that we can send. After that, we have to look to the organization and then. But the strongest message that we can send to the threats in the world that try to 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 uh, to uh, contest our 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 way of uh, of 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 living is to say that we are together, and uh, and uh, I strongly believe that uh, if we lose this perspective, we will start discussing about the technicalities uh, regarding the NATO situation or other organization situation and we lose the, the main and, and the basics of, of that message. And this message is based, uh, has been repeated today in many occasions in values, in sharing the way in which uh, with all the discrepancies of normal in politics, we do not discuss uh, the, 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 the freedom, the justice, the human rights, the democracy, the free market, and so on. And the, 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 what we have built along the last, uh, in t regarding Spain, since uh, basically as a democracy since 1978. No? And uh, so whatever is uh, uh, sending a message that we, uh, in all family matters, there are ups and downs, as uh, you know, no? But if we make the stress in the downs in, instead of in the possibility of the coming to the ups again, we are, uh, um, we are giving uh, the others a good internally and outside the, the, our uh, alliance, we are sending the message that they are uh, expecting from us to send, which is weakness. And therefore, all of us, uh, that's why I, strongly believe, and I, uh, Secretary Carter knows that because he listened to me uh, sometimes, um, that, uh, mm, and it was discussed within NATO, and this is a good example, that the, the best message that Europe can send and can provide to an alliance like NATO is to have to do our homework. And our homework is not only to invest Two percent, not in NATO, as I have heard today. It is not in NATO. It is in our own budgets, right. which is a little bit different because in NATO, all of us we pay our quota, and uh, and NATO is working perfectly well. But we need to do more in our own countries, you know. So the the what I was fighting for within the European Union and we have a country which was not very much in favor of that, it was to build up a consistent European defense capability to afford to NATO, not to, to do our job isolated, to afford to NATO. Because if you go to that, to, 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 to that meeting of uh, in NATO, you found that, uh, that it was very difficult to manage that on on uh, in these uh, huge uh, meetings where uh, Mr. Carter, Secretary Carter, said what we had to do, and we <laughs> did, but we spent hours listening to each other and, uh, and trying Ash to understand. Reply. So I think that <laughs> today and uh, and uh, today, and I can I can tell you that this uh, this commitment of the European countries to NATO comes not from President Trump. Uh, 
Secretary Gates, in his uh, farewell speech, yeah. said not to percent, but uh, to increase the, the amount. And also, I think that uh, the, the, the situation is, A, we had to, to, to provide to the Alliance with a commitment which is based not only in values, principles, but also in, in commit, economic commitment, which means a lot, because the budget law is the most important political law, at least in, the, in my country, which where, where you, where you, uh, you back your political ideas with the capacity to carry on with them. So I think that uh, we need to do this. We need to, to create, to build up a European defense United States has less people in the armed forces than the, the, the European Union and can deploy, uh, I think that we, we can deploy only the 10% that the United States can deploy in, a, in, in the abroad. And that means, that means a, a, a chaotic situation there, no? because what we should do is to be efficient and to say, well, we are the two, and now it's easier that we share. Uh, we understand. The, we, we were fighting, and thanks to, 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 to Secretary Carter, I remember, I, we were fighting as hell to include the South in the, in the strategy of NATO. And in, the, in 2013, when we were discussing what to speak about in the NATO summit in, in Newport, in Cardiff, we were discussing about transatlantic bond, more investment, and, and partners, new partners. When we arrived to Cardiff, we had the Crimea problem, ISIS had grown, and so we just spoke about the money, but the transatlantic bond and, uh, and the new partnerships were out of the picture because we had the problem in front of us in a very short term. So, uh, brief, I think that, uh, that uh, I strongly believe in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the unity, as, as the, the, the sincere unity as a deterrence for the world. We mean a lot of military, a lot of economic, a lot of values, a lot of, of uh, even connections uh, and in, invisible connections between our both parts, shores of the Atlantic. And this is our force. And the more we criticize ourselves and the more we divide ourselves, the worse for all of us. And this is something that uh, responsible leaders should take into consideration. Thank you very much. Um, we want to thank you in advance because we're, Harvard is going to descend upon Madrid and Segovia uh, after July 4th. We have our first big conference for this program is going to be with our friend and colleague uh, Dean Manuel Muniz in Madrid and then in the historic city of Segovia and we plan to make this an annual trip that we bring Harvard professors, students and fellows to have a conference with you. The question is as governments bicker and argue across the Atlantic, do you sense in Spain and Europe that there's still strong public support for the transatlantic link with Canada and the US? Is that weakening as well, or is it strong? I think that uh, I kind of speak in this regard because I don't have the experience of our diplomats. I can say that uh, in my country, the feeling that uh, transatlantic bond is uh, is uh, in even if it is very internalized, it is a guarantee for what we have been fighting for the last fifty or sixty or years. I strongly believe that uh, the Spanish people um, have uh, the conviction that uh, the European Union is probably, in my opinion, it is the most challenging and important. Uh, of political objective that humanity has put in front of them because we were fighting as hell against each other for the last 2,000 years and not for the last uh, 100 years, for the last 2,000 years. There are very many things that have, we have to be solved, but if we arrive to something that we could 
call a union, a European Union, we can, we can uh, uh, present the world with a key or with a system that can solve probably the most dramatic situations that we are still living today. And that's why I, I believe that uh, we in Spain, we believe in the European Union. Well, I mean, the Brexit has done a little bit of harm, but, um, but uh, we are still there and we can give the world the example that generosity and leadership is uh, the one of the keys for, uh, for a world which is not an easy thing to manage. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is what, uh, what, uh, what I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, Ambassador O'Sullivan, you're in the most interesting position of all, not just because you're the last to speak in this round, but because if you think about what we Americans have thought about the European project, President Truman supported the coal and steel community and President Eisenhower supported the Treaty of Rome and Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon and Ford supported the common market and every president since Carter has been profoundly supportive of the idea of going further with monetary union, the European Union, until now. You now have a president who is actively contesting this support. This is just my perspective and you can feel free to disagree or not even comment. <laughs> um, the idea that it's in the American interest to see the European Union succeed in trade terms, climate change, every other way. This is, I think, what troubles me more than anything else about what's happened. Uh, and I know that there are bounds you can't cross as a diplomat, but how do you, what's the nature of conversation with the Americans these days? Well, um, I think it would be naive of me to say that the election of President Trump hasn't changed things. I mean, he was elected on a very clear platform of changing the way America looks at the world. Yeah. And it would be disrespectful of the rest of us not to take that into account and not to expect that there's going to be change. Having said that, um, I had the privilege of being in Dallas just recently and I, I met with uh, George W. Bush and spent a couple of hours with him and we kind of reminisced a bit about his presidency. And we were just talking about, um, there was a, a dispute over steel tariffs in 2001. Yeah. Uh, he declined to join the Kyoto Protocol on climate change. Mm -hmm. We had a disagreement over the Iraq war, and he wasn't very happy with the European initiative of starting talks with Iran on uh, a I nuclear deal. <laughs> does all that sound a bit familiar? It does. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that it usually takes American presidents into their second term to understand the value, particularly of the European Union as an institution. What did President Obama do in his first, uh, first uh, it was the pivot to Asia. So we're kind of used to not being, you know, the immediate, uh, f focus of, of, a, of an incoming president's attention. Uh, I think we demonstrate our relevance and our usefulness over time, and I believe we will do that again. Uh, I have no fear that the most forensic analysis of America first will lead you to the conclusion that the transatlantic relationship is absolutely fundamental to America's self-interest from an economic and commercial point of view, from a security point of view, and from the values agenda, even though that's a sort of, you know, something that comes and goes, uh, uh, from more emphasis in some cases on democracy or on human rights or on, on the rule of law. But th those fundamental values unite us together more than any other pairing in the world. And the debate with the students this afternoon, saying is Europe or the European Union America's most important partner Frankly, who else is the important partner? We may be an imperfect partner, and you're an imperfect partner for us, <laughs> but you know, who are you going to call? It's not Ghostbusters. We're going to call you. You're going to call us. <laughs> and I, I'm not worried about the stresses and strains of the ups and downs of the relationship, because I know when the chips are down, any president defending the interest of this country is going to realize that the transatlantic relationship is essential for the economic security future of this country, as is that relationship is for the European Union and its member states. Boy, I agree with every word you just said. <laughs> you are such a good diplomat, too. What a great answer. I thought I was asking you a tough question. You handled it perfectly. We're going to need to go to questions from students, but very quickly for all of you. Let's start with you, David, and come right back down the line. We've got a Putin challenge. 
invading countries to his south and west. So we've got Ash and others, and, and President Trump have been building fortifications, containment against him with Europe. We've got, he's trying to invade uh, all of our electoral systems and undermine our democratic voting. He tried in Germany, he did it successfully in a way in the United States, he'll try again. Nerve agent attack, Salisbury in England, enabling Assad's use of chemical weapons. We have four different types of EU and US sanctions on, on Russia right now. How do we handle this? Is this just a, I suggested today, but not many people agree with me, we're gonna have to contain him for the rest of his political life. He's shown no indication he wants to work with us. Are we in containment, broad economic, military containment mode, or is there some way that we can work with this Russian government to resolve some of these problems? Well, I think we have to keep on trying. I don't disagree with your, your basic analysis that we have entered into a period of enormous difficulty with, with Russia. Uh, I think many people in this room, and many I see familiar faces uh, who've worked in this area down the years, we all hoped that with the collapse of the, 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 the Berlin Wall, with uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Russia could become a normal partner of the international community. That was what we wished and that was the direction in which we have worked for years and years. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that Mr. Putin doesn't want that. It's not the relationship he wants. I think we have to be careful, as was said in some of the panels today, not to demonize this on the personality of Mr. Putin. I mean, he has his personality and he plays a role, but I think he also is tapping into uh, 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 you know, deeply held views in Russia, and I think the fact if he were to disappear in the morning, it's not clear to me that he would be replaced by a Kerensky, you know, wonderful liberal Democrat uh, Russian. Uh, I think the risk that it could be somebody even, even more aggressive is, is, is not to be excluded. So I don't think we should excessively personalize it around him, but we have to understand that there's a very difficult dynamic. And I think we have to be, and this is the, the, the principle on which the European Union has based our relationship with, with Russia, is to push back in the areas where we disagree, and we disagree strongly about Crimea, about the interference in, 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 in the eastern provinces uh, of Ukraine, uh, about what's happening in Georgia and some of the other frozen conflicts on what's happening uh, in, in Syria. We have, to, we have to push back and be very firm because I think Mr. Putin only respects firmness. On the other hand, we have to keep the, the dialogue open. We have sure. to keep the channels of communication. We do not wish a major rupture with Russia, which is such an important part of our continent. We have such ties with the Russian people of literature and culture. We do not wish to create a complete alienation. And we have to keep this, I'm afraid, this slightly schizophrenic uh, approach of, of being firm when we are unhappy and being clear and being willing to take tough decisions, including on sanctions while at the same time keeping the channels of communication open and trying to find a way to get to a better place. In the end, I agree, this will not be decided by us as much as by Mr. Putin and the Russian government as to how willing they are to engage. The more willing they are to engage, the more we go towards the dialogue and some kind of constructive outcome, the less willing they are, unfortunately, the more we will, we will have confrontation and we will have difficulties. And I think we have to be willing and open to do both. We have to be ready to be firm. On the other hand, we have to keep a, a, a basic objective. This is not where we want to be in the medium or, or the long term with Russia uh, on our continent uh, and for the future of that country, but also for all that that means for the stability of our neighborhood and, and the wider region, as we can see, Russia's ability to uh, create problems uh, elsewhere is, is, is considerable, even if they are uh, considered maybe a diminishing power, the economy is going down, but they still have considerable ability to make all our lives more difficult, and we have to try and work with that. Thank you very much. One of the things that we've been talking about here, Ash and I, Doug, um, this has to be on our program, Outreach to Europe has to be towards Russia and Ukraine as well. We have very few Russian students here. We need more of that. We need more scholarly exchanges. I, mean, I agree very much with your keep the channels open and our small part will be to make this program focus on those countries as well. Ambassador. Well, I, can, I cannot agree more uh, with what uh, David had said. We have uh, had the experience of uh, interference of Russia in some uh, internal problems that we have had lately. And uh, at the same time, I have uh, uh, an anecdote who, who the, the, the crown prince of, or crown emir of, uh, 
or of uh, Bahrain uh, in, a, in a trip with the King of Spain, um, told me about um, uh, President Putin. And uh, because he was uh, coming back from Sochi, and he told me that uh, I have just had a meeting with Putin, and I asked him, well, what does Putin, how Putin see uh, the West? And uh, what is his position now? And uh, the man told me, Putin has told me that he's fed up, that the West, sorry for, for the, that is, uh, the West treats him like, like this. He wants to, treat, to be treated like this. Since then, this was in 2014, 2013, I have seen that uh, all the movements that this man has made is just to explain the world that he is willing to play the game that the former leaders of the, of the Russia, the Soviet Union played. And, uh, and this is something that is within the nationalist way that the Russians have very much inside themselves. So with this key, and with the idea that Putin will do whatever is necessary to show the world that he is in the same level of the powers, the big powers of the world, we have to look uh, that, uh, to him and to all the actions that he carries out because he is not playing the game with the rules we are playing. But the objective is to be treated as a great power. And uh, uh, Ambassador Sullivan has said that um, that we have to give uh, Putin the idea that he is not our foe, our, our, our threat, no? But he is the only language that he understands is, and this is something that I know because of my times in the, in the defense, it is that the, he is not allowed to do what he wants and uh, he imposes. Let's speak about the Baltic patrol, air patrol, yeah. the, the Baltic Sea, the, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and wherever they try to, even in the coasts of the, uh, the northwest of Spain, with the aircraft trying to, to push and to, to, to against the, the borders. The, so to say no, that is not possible. And this language of firmness has to be very clear. And we cannot be he hidden by, by, the, by, the, by the, the, the first firmness, second dialogue and connection, but not the other way around because he doesn't understand the language of dialogue because he was, he's doing his, his things by, by his own way. And, and, and for my surprise, in, in, in this internal problem that Spain has had, he was intervening in that. And what is the purpose of his intervention? It's just the contrary of what I have said before, is to divide, to divide. And uh, to divide ourselves, to divide ourselves. And, uh, and this is uh, the trick in which we cannot uh, uh, enter because uh, he knows exactly what he wants and Thank we should know exactly what we want. Uh, Thank, we you. To, mm? Thank you very much. Julie? Uh, well, a lot has been said, uh, so uh, I w will just uh, uh, second everything that's been said and add two other points. One, transatlantic unity is certainly one of the best cards we have to play in coping with Putin, who will be with us for quite some time, um, at least till 2024, if not longer. Um, so for us to now get captured by some sort of transatlantic dispute uh, over trade or disagreements over sanctions policy or the Iran deal would be just a gift for Putin that would keep on giving. I mean, he seizes on moments when we are divided and likes to use those moments to drive a wedge between us that will continue to either separate Europe from within or to separate Europe from the United States. So transatlantic unity, point one. Point two, just strategically, I think when we talk about Russia in the Middle East, we 
we tend to focus almost exclusively on what Russia is doing inside Syria. But what I think the transatlantic partners are missing right now is a broader conversation about Russia's play across the Middle East Libya. and paying a little bit more yeah. attention to Russia, Turkey, Russia, Egypt, Russia, Saudi, even Russia, Iraq. Not that they're ultimately going to change our relationships with these countries, but there is a strategy there, there is a play, and I think we're missing it because we get so focused on their mission inside Syria. Thank you very much. Peter, your country has had probably the most intense dialogue over decades of any country with Russia, Germany. So you have a unique view here. Yeah, I, I agree with this analysis. 2014, the annexation of Crimea has been a geopolitical game changer. Russia became, uh, redrew the map and became a revisionist uh, power. And uh, we, 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 we have been seeing an extension of Russian influence, not only in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, the hybrid warfare, but also in, in the world, in the Middle East, uh, Russia is uh, coming back to where the Soviet Union has been, in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Libya, and Afghanistan. So this is a worrying, really newly assertive Russia that we've got to deal with. I agree, double-track approach, strong deterrence, strong defense, and on the other hand, uh, dialogue. And you've referred to Chancellor Merkel, to our role in the Ukraine crisis. I think that was the right thing to do, to set up together with this, uh, with the French president at the time, this Minsk process. Minsk has not been a success, uh, but it has prevented worse things from happening. It has pre prevented, my belief, a hot war between uh, Russia and, and the Ukraine. So dialogue is is important. I would add, in the transatlantic relationship, one uh, sort of one thought. Um, I think we need to think about a common strategy. It's a big word, I know, but a, a common thinking, a common approach towards Russia. Let's not reduce our policy to sanctions only. Sanctions are a very important tool, especially when we don't want to use any military option. Sanctions are extremely important, but they have a purpose. They have a purpose to change the government or uh, the behavior of the government of the country that is targeted. Or individuals are targeted, which we don't want to deal with, or entities, businesses. But we should be careful not to reduce our approach to Russia to sanctions, and especially when um, sanctions are hitting third countries, and in this case, uh, European economies. And, and I, I flag this because I see a weakening support for, let's say, a, an American approach that would be sort of trigger-happy sanctions-wise. Um, I, I think let's think about sanctions, let's keep them targeted, let's not hurt the European economy by sanctioning, by you know, unilateral um, American sanctions that have an um, extraterritorial effect. I see this support um, in Europe eroding fast, um, it makes our approach to Russia and Putin more difficult. I think Chancellor Merkel has been instrumental in keeping the EU together on the sanctions front. Uh, we are strong when we are united. Um, if the US uh, you know, advances without uh, European support, it will make us weaker. And I see signs of um, you know, waves of yet again new sanctions that have detrimental effects on our unity. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for a very, very fine conversation. We're going to go to questions uh, from students uh, or anyone else who wants to ask a question. We have four microphones, two on the floor, two in the balconies. I would just ask when you ask your question, please identify yourself and please make sure that the question ends with a question mark. Sir, you're first, please. My name is Robert Rodriguez. I graduated from the school many moons ago. 
Uh, earlier, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here for, for your insights. Um, earlier, uh, Professor Burns, uh, in talking to Ambassador O'Sullivan, said there are limits to what you can say because of your diplomatic uh, duties. And so my question is, is he right? Uh, isn't Trump's signature the idea of testing limits and redefining the way we've approached anything in the past? And through the lens of game theory, how much do you buy in the art of, of the deal? And do you change the way you approach diplomacy in this era? Julie, <laughs> if the ambassadors I'm answer the, this, I'm not the diplomat. They, this is like a slippery slope for the sitting ambassadors. But you are out of government. You can answer I, this question. I, I am. No one cleared my talking <laughs> points. Um, I don't have any talking points. Uh, well, I guess I'd say, um, you know, one of the things that Trump does pride himself on is the strategic ambiguity, and he believes, maybe rightly, in a few cases that surrounding your adversaries with all this uncertainty gives you the upper hand. And because he's a little bit crazy, no one knows exactly what he's gonna do. And some would even say that he was able to get this meeting with Kim Jong-un because of the way in which he's handled the North Korea crisis, calling him a rocket man, and you know some pretty outlandish uh, statements. That all may be true, and we could sit here tonight and debate that, the one area where strategic ambiguity does not work in my mind is with your allies. And I think what he's doing is he's also using it with our closest allies and leaving a great deal of uncertainty around how he feels about the core pillars of our relationship. And even in the press conference with Macron today, there was a lot of, on the one hand, I could do this, but maybe I'll do that, and maybe I'll do this. We'll see, who knows? And that's not, that's <laughs> not a normal way to run a press conference with one of America's closest allies. Um, and so you find a lot of our allies at the embassies around town, um, and not just our European allies, but allies from all corners of the earth, scrambling around trying to navigate this very uncertain environment. Um, first and foremost, they don't have the normal interlocutors, and he almost prides himself on the fact that he's not staffing the government in any normal way. We have one assistant secretary at the State Department right now. Fortunately, it's for Europe, so all of us have some somebody to talk to. Uh, but for everybody else dealing with every other corner of the world, there's no one to even go to to say, what did he mean by that? Or what, what's the plan? What, what's your policy? What's the big idea? So um, I, in that way, um, you know, maybe some of his supporters would say, you go with the, you know, what a you know, brilliant idea and approach to foreign policy. But I feel like I can see in practice how it's really creating some issues with some of our closest partners around the world. Thank you, Julie. Unless anybody else wants to dive in, which I doubt very much. We'll go to your question, thank you. Hi, good evening, my name is Kezia and I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, and my question is given the continued instability and uncertainty in the Middle East uh, and our government's present um, hesitation to accept more refugees, uh, does that change the stance of the European Union or add added pressure to Europe to deal with the, Euro the refugee crisis? Thank you very much. David, do you want to lead on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, to be very frank, I, I don't think, I mean, we would like America to take more, but I don't think they're ever going to take numbers which would actually make a dint in the problem we face. So I, I think we should not misplace this. This is our geography. We live in, we live in that part of the world, and we are inevitably going to uh, be the, the magnet for many of these people. It's important, I think, to emphasize that it's the neighboring countries that have borne the brunt. Uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey have actually taken many more millions than we've had to in Europe. It's a 
it's still more difficult when you, you get people coming into, into the European Union, but also because, frankly, the suspicion is they will not just want to be there temporarily, but it may be a more permanent, they're not just going to be refugees for a few months or a few years until the situation corrects itself. So it, it, it's, even though it's refugee or asylum seekers and, and they're entitled to international protection, there's also a sense that the, the difference in standard of living is such that people will actually wish to live there more permanently and that, that poses a slightly different problem. Uh, we have to deal with this in Europe. I think we have, we have got a handle on it now better than the sort of sense of crisis we had in 2015. Um, we've strengthened our, our management of the border, we haven't closed our borders. Uh, we need to address how we deal with this internally, how we avoid that the frontline states, uh, Italy, Greece, Malta, Spain to a certain extent, who, who are in the front line of being in the receiving, that they're left to handle this alone. If we were dealing with this on a continental scale, it would not be so difficult, but that's not the way we're set up, and we have to kind of reorganize ourselves to figure out how we do that. And we have to accept that we, we will need legal pathways, uh, more legal pathways for migration, particularly for economic migration, because we, we, we will need migrants uh, with our demographics. Uh, it's a complicated adjustment for us. Uh, I think we'll get there, uh, but we have to accept that our geography is such that we're going to face this in a particular way for 20, 30 years. Uh, that the instability in the region, as you say, the demographics of Africa, uh, and just where we are, this is going to be a European problem for many years to come. We are grateful for the fact that the US is a major contributor to the international agencies. We wish that the rest of the international community would contribute more. Underfunding to the international agencies dealing with refugees is a major cause of the of the migration of, of people we need a, a, a more global response uh, but I I don't think to be very blunt that we think America taking larger numbers uh, would would make any significant difference what we need is support for how we can address the, the bigger problem and the root causes I would just this is a very good question David Miliband was on this stage two months ago yeah. president of the International Rescue Committee former British Foreign Secretary and he reminded us that in every refugee crisis worldwide since 1945, the United States has always taken half of the refugees that the United Nations deems to, should say should be resettled, except in this crisis. The Trump administration has taken exactly 11 Syrian refugees. The Obama administration, 12,500, but they were capped by the Republican Congress. And so uh, David felt, and I certainly feel, and I honor this question, that we are not doing what we must to help you at a time when Germany, for instance, has been, so, has been inundated. And I just, I think there's a lot of concern in the campus about this. So you were very diplomatic in your answer and I thank you for that. But we should be doing more as a country. Yeah, uh, just, just to remind people, there are 11 million displaced Syrians. Yeah. 11 million displaced yeah. Syrians. So, you know, even if you took three times as many as you have traditionally, what, about 75,000 refugees a year, even if you tripled it, you're still not going to make a dent in, in, in what, we have to, what we have to manage in the region. I'm not saying that Europe is alone in having to manage it. We all have to manage it. So th that's my point. I'm not saying that we would not like you to take a few more, but I just don't think it's going to make numerically a substantial difference in the, in, the, in the scale of the challenge which Europe and the wider region around us face uh, as a result of this Syrian catastrophe. And, and it's an American debate. We're an immigrant nation, but the president doesn't want to honor that. We would never tradition. discourage you from taking more. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, that's loud. My name is Cameron, and I'm a senior at the college. Um, and I have a question specifically about the productive relationships that can happen across the transatlantic with regards to the Syrian crisis. As we know, it's been going on since 2013. And at least from my perspective, there doesn't really seem to be an end in sight. My question to you all today is, do you see the potential for European Union and United States multilateral interventions to actually combat the Assad regime and put an end to this? Is that a productive space that we can think about for transatlantic relations? Thank you very much. Who would like to take the lead on that question? David. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, let's Everyone's pointing at you, let's David. Let's, let's be very clear. Uh, this is the greatest humanitarian catastrophe of our generation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it is an absolute catastrophe. And the damage which has been done to, the, to, the, to, to, the, to Syria itself and to the Syrian people, we probably have a generation of uh, young Syrian people who may never have been to school. And the price we will pay for that 
10, 15, 20 years from now is, is incalculable. So this is a very, very serious problem for the international community, and we have failed to address it. I don't think the US has failed, I don't think the EU has failed, and collectively we have failed to address it because it's very intractable. Uh, it, it, is, it, has, it has turned into a civil war with multiple actors, uh, interference from Turkey, from Iran, uh, from, from the, 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 the Gulf states. It's, it's, it's not easy, to, it's, it's, if it were easy, frankly, we would have solved it. So I think we have tried. I think the US and the EU, we have tried through the Geneva process. We have tried in various ways. But we have to be clear, I don't think either in Europe or in the United States there is any support for a military intervention to actually try to impose a, a, a peaceful settlement. I mean, I think, or sorry, to impose a peace, a, a ceasefire. And I think we have to accept that. That's a political reality here and in, and in Europe. And as long as we're not willing to do that, then we are inevitably going to be working on trying to find diplomatic and, and other ways to, to end the conflict and to start a process of, of political reconstruction in, in Syria to help the Syrian people rebuild their politics and also their country. There's a, a conference in Brussels today on uh, reconstruction. We are, we've been taking a lead as the European Union in thinking about the day after tomorrow uh, about how we can help the country rebuild, help the refugees come back. It's going to take a massive investment from the international community. But the precondition for that to work is a political a ceasefire and a, and a political settlement, which so far has eluded us and it's, it's a tragedy. Julian Peter, isn't there an option for Mike Pompeo? He's going to be confirmed by the Senate as Secretary of State tomorrow. He'll be in NATO Thursday and Friday meeting with his European counterparts. Right now, the future of Syria is being decided by the Russians, the Iranians, Hezbollah, and the Turks. And the Europeans, the Sunni Arabs, and the Americans are locked out. Isn't there not a military option, but a big diplomatic coalition that Europe, America, and the Arab world should put together, shouldn't we be at that table? Well, by all means, um, I, I, I also thank uh, you for your question. Um, I maybe just, uh, you know, um, a reminiscence. Um, I, I served in the Security Council mm. uh, in 2011 when the Syrian crisis broke out. And I think before it morphed into a civil war, and then a proxy war. We had a small window of opportunity um, to uh, basically come to a political arrangement if Assad had played along with, at that time, uh, the opposition. And the one who blocked it was, was Russia in yeah. the Security Council. And then it morphed into a civil war and it was the point of no return. But I agree, it's the, not only the greatest humanitarian catastrophe of our time, also the greatest failure of the international community, of the Security Council, in, in a way also for the West. I served in Lebanon, I was ambassador there. Lebanon had to go through um, a civil war of 15 years. I fear, I fear that we are mm. seeing something similar if we don't act together. I agree. Uh, the political process is the prerequisite for um, safety that can then uh, ensue humanitarian work. It, it will be an uphill battle. <laughs> we, we've got to be clear-eyed, and I think this is how we lost. Assad has to be part of the game. Not in the long run, but in the short run. Russia uh, has to be at the table. Iran might have to be an interlocutor in this political process. So um, I think we, we should be very clear-eyed that we have to swallow a lot of unpleasant facts in order to have a promising political process. It will cost us dearly to um, uh, realize that we have to sit at the table with some unpleasant uh, interlocutors, but it's necessary if, if we want to stop that humanitarian catastrophe and eventually come to terms with the refugee issue, which is really um, a threat to um, the neighboring countries. Thank you very much, Peter. Julie, we have to be at the, t I think everyone agrees yeah, we have to sit with the Russians yeah, and Iranians, yeah. but we're not even at the table. Yeah, yeah. But this also comes back to the point about not staffing the government. I mean, if, if 
it would be helpful right now if we had ambassadors in key posts across the region and across Europe. It would be helpful if the State Department was staffed up. I mean, I'm hoping Pompeo will do that. Yeah. It would be helpful if we had some sense that there was a proper interagency process on Syria above and beyond the president changing his mind every other day. But I don't want to be smug about this. We in the Obama administration, we had many of those things. We did staff the government. We had ambassadors. We had a secretary of state that worked tirelessly on the political process. And we didn't get anywhere in the Rubik's Cube that Syria has become. And nothing haunts me more than the work that I did and helped with on Syria when I was in the Obama administration. I think about those meetings all the time, going into the Situation Room twice a week to sit down to talk about Syria and never walking out with a sense that we had solved this Rubik's Cube and how frustrating that was year after year after year in government. So, you know, we can sit here and make remarks about how, you know, Trump said he was leaving Syria and then after the chemical weapons attack, he decided to strike Syria. Now today it seemed like he wanted to get back out. That's, you know, something that we can criticize, but, you know, we could have anyone in the Oval Office right now and that person would be grappling with this intractable problem. Um, but I, I do take your point that the United States does need to be represented at the table uh, to the degree that there is actual a di actually a dialogue going on. And I do hope that Pompeo at least can be that voice as the international community comes to discuss the future of Syria. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much for your time. My name is Rich McManus. I'm with the Executive Education Program right now. Uh, here for a month, but I bring to you a question. As you mentioned, the problem of Putin or that the Putin is a threat, the term that came to my mind as we discussed this was uh, actually an old Cold War term that bring, carries baggage, which is brinksmanship. And you see a lot of uh, aggressive policies that are being met a little more confrontational than we've seen in the past. And I think that Putin's skill set really is to bring economic information, military, and coercive powers across the spectrum. And so I guess my question is if we think of things like term, the term containment was mentioned as well, and if you think about it, that kind of brinksmanship, those are strong terms. But I think the underlying theme is that there is an ex we have to be a little risk acceptant in the way we deal with Russia as we, as we hammer through this next decade of turmoil. Uh, so my question is, uh, is brinksmanship coming back? Uh, and two, if we are willing to be more aggressive in our policies, or if we are forced to be more risk acceptant in the way we deal with them, how do we do that as an alliance as opposed to individual nations? It's a great question. We're going to end on this question. Maybe I can just ask all of you to respond to it. And the broader issue here is how do we defend our democracies uh, against the hybrid of cyber offenses of the Russian government and the brinksmanship that this gentleman referred to? Ambassador. I, uh, I think that um, the most important thing is uh, well, it has two, two, two phases. The first is to be aware and to accept the reality. This is very important uh, and not to, to, to look at the reality with nuances that are convenient because uh, in the short term it's easier to, 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 to overlap the situation. No, no, no. The, 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 the threat has a name and the threat has a way ways through which this threat is materialized every day. No? And this is something that we have to recognize. That is the, the initial point to get to a solution. So um, I think that uh, that's why I said before that firmness in the, the answer is, uh, is the, to give the, 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 the responsible for the threat the clear message that we know what he is doing and how he is doing and that he is doing what he is doing and not the powers hidden in the in the in the, in the cyber space and so on this is the first thing and the second thing is that we have uh, uh, capacity enough to uh, making him paying the price of what he is doing and the price of what he is doing is uh, the tremendous tragedy of Syria, 
the the situation that we have lived in in Ukraine, the threats that we are the Baltic countries are having, and then then the, and the, and to say that he wants to play a game in the in the international power as he wants to play, he has to follow the rules that the big powers have to follow to have the trust and the credibility. Because frankly speaking, he is more what, uh, the, I mean the appearance of threat is higher, and they are masters in doing that, than the capacity they have to sustain this, that threat. And that is the reality. No? And we are living in a reality which is not exactly what is behind, and we saw that when the, when the wall fall, de fall, fall down fell down and we saw what was uh, what was behind the wall no and this is today is more or less the same so clarity reality firmness and uh, any type of bridges to get out from this type of attitude toward the west but these the bridges for getting out of that not to continue doing the same the same game that is my my view and and um, i think it's a little bit uh, using the, his own language in order to say this is the mirror that you have in front of you. We cannot accept another language than the language in which we believe, which is democracy, fairness, loyalty, uh, uh, rule of law, and so on. Something who he is telling his people that he is living with. By the way, he's been elected. He has a, a so-called type of democracy, and so on, so on, so on. So no more, uh, no more. Uh, how you call that? Uh, fancy dresses. Thank you very much, Ambassador okay. Sullivan. Well, it's 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 a it's a tough question. I mean, I I think it was Douglas Alexander said on one of the panels today that you know one thing perhaps we need to think about. Uh, in the transatlantic alliance is how we redefine uh, a trigger of Article 5 in terms of it's not necessarily tanks rolling across the frontier, it can take other forms of aggression, which we need to think about how we're going to respond to, uh, and we, we see that fairly clearly, I think, in, in the sort of what's been done in, in Ukraine, but also, frankly, what's been done in Syria. I mean, in Syria, we've nearly had confrontation between US forces and Russian forces. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, this is a very dangerous situation, and, and we've kind of, set aside some of the, the, the fail-safe mechanisms we had in the Cold War. I mean, I'm not saying we need to reinvent them, but maybe we just need to think a bit more about how we avoid uh, something, something terrible happening uh, almost by a series of, of unfortunate accidents. Uh, at the same time, I think, and I agree with my Spanish colleague, that th there are two points I would make. One is there needs to be a price when it is clearly identified who is at the origin of these uh, of these of these sort of non-typical uh, aggression activities i agree entirely with peter wittig my german colleague that we cannot reduce everything to sanctions uh, on the other hand there has to be a price there has to be a consequence at some point and and i think that needs to be made more clear the bigger question for all of us in in western society it seems to me is the resilience of our societies because at the end of the day Putin and his tactics are playing on the fault lines within our own societies. And we will be as strong as our own societies are. And we have to pay attention to that. We can try and stop him exploiting the fault lines, but if the fault lines are there, uh, it's, 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 it's a weakness. And we need to uh, really think about how we do that in terms of, and that's a domestic issue for all of us in, in the European Union. It's more complicated. We've got 28 member states. We need to do it on a European level, but ultimately it happens in individual countries and, and the, our ability as the European Union to, to, to develop that resilience will be different from the way you will do it in the United States. But I think that is a challenge we really have to take very seriously. We talked about it in one of the panels today about political parties, about how you kind of rebuild a certain consensus in our societies which was there and which has for various reasons evaporated sense of lack of social justice, uh, the kind of changing nature of technology, the nature of work, which is fragmenting our, our, our societies in, in new ways. These are, these are the issues. If we don't work on fixing those problems within our own societies, we will be continuously vulnerable to this kind of external interference. Thank you. Brinksmanship, Peter. Well, um, in, on resilience, um, I, I would say, yeah, let's be as firm 
as um, uh, resilient uh, as possible in, in terms of meddling in the internal affairs. We all know that it, it's happening um, you know, by Russia. Uh, in our elections uh, in last September, uh, we all expected Russia to I intervene with all kinds of tools. In the end, it didn't really happen. Why? Because there was so much awareness in the population that it would happen, that apparently then it was decided that it wouldn't make sense to meddle because it might, might have backfired. So uh, awareness, public awareness of Russian meddling is, is one of the best uh, tools for resilience. I, I want to um, make one point on our Russia um, approach. I think we can do better as a transatlantic alliance on, on Russia. We are not united uh, here. I see, I mean, I say this in an analytical spirit when I observe this, um, you know, the wa Washington um, debate here. There, there is a, a, a very assertive Congress um, motivated by, you know, also domestic reasons. And there is an administration that has not been acting very consistently on Russia. There's a president who expresses his wish to have um, a more closer relationship with Putin. And so that does not really add up to a consistent approach. I understand that for domestic uh, reasons. I think it would be a good thing uh, that uh, the President of the United States would eventually have a meaningful, well-prepared meeting with uh, President Putin. I think it would serve us well. I think it is an Great. anomaly mm -hmm. that there is a very awkward relationship between um, the leaders of the US and, and Russia. But it has to be based on a clear, well-prepared process of what the deliverables would be and the messaging would be. But I think that would serve us all well. I think we should sit together and harmonize our Russia approach. I believe uh, Chancellor Merkel will uh, talk with the president on, on our Russia approach. Um, yeah, that's at least my expectation. Good, thank you very much. Julie, last word of the evening. We're looking uh, for hope and wisdom. Oh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, uh, quickly <laughs> on this topic, uh, just to second again, everything that's already been said. I know we as partners are focused very much on the new tools we need to deal with energy coercion and disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks. But I would remind folks that we have to stay equally as focused on the military side. Ever since Russia went into Georgia in 2008, they've worked very hard over 10 years to dramatically modernize their military and how they're utilizing that military now from everything snap exercises to buzzing our ships in the Black Sea, they've come very, very close in a couple of instances to a collision with either a commercial jet or a U.S. naval ship. Uh, some possible incident I fear like that could be in our future because of the dangerous way in which they are using this military now to exert power and project power into all sorts of regions in and around Europe. So sorry, that's not hope, that's and, not wisdom. hope and wisdom, but yeah, that's reality. Yeah, 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 that's the reality. So yeah, yeah. Julie Smith, Ambassador Wittig, Ambassador Morenas, Ambassador O'Sullivan, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Well done. Well done.